The measures of relative standing. I feel like I talked about this already. I probably did somewhere, but anyway. Um, the Z-score, we didn't mention that at all? Okay, good. Okay. Okay. But we finished that as well, right? Yes, we did. Okay. Okay, good. Okay. Workspace. No, that's not on the calculator. Variation is on the calculator, but coefficient of variation is not. Huh? Maybe. Yeah. And we talked about it, but it's built into the calculator. Okay. Okay, so a z-score um, measures the distance that a value is from the mean in terms of standard deviations. It is, let me say it this way, the number of standard deviations that x is from the mean. Okay, it measures distance from the mean in terms of how many standard deviations. Okay, that's what the z-score is. Okay, it measures the distance from the mean in terms of um, how many standard deviations. The formula for z-score is x minus x bar divided by s. Or if for whatever reason we were doing population data, it'd be z equals x minus mu divided by sigma. Okay. So um, the round off rule, I, you might have noticed in your textbook that they gave you different round off rules. I hadn't really cared. But when it comes to z scores, we, real, we will round off to two decimal places. Okay, that's going to be important a little bit later. Uh, so that everybody's on the same page, whether they're using a table or the calculator. So usually we round our z values to two decimal places. Now, uh, we've talked about some of this already. And basically, within two standard deviations of the mean, we have what we consider to be ordinary values. Okay, Even when we talked about the empirical rule, we were talking about within one standard deviation, two standard deviations, three standard deviations. Remember, within two standard deviations of the mean, according to the empirical rule, we had how much of our data? I hadn't heard it yet. 95, approximately 95% of our data. So, you know, outside of two standard deviations of the mean, we start to think that things are unusual. Okay, so um, z-scores beyond uh, minus 2, plus 2 are unusual. Sometimes you might need to check make sure you didn't make an error. You know, if you get a z-score of 10, that's not impossible, but that's a value that's highly unusual. So it could be an error, you know, something you did wrong or whatever. Okay, how do we even use this information? Let's look at this example. Okay, it says data set 16 and appendix B list 50 magnitudes on the Richter scale of uh, 50 earthquakes. And those earthquakes have magnitudes with a mean of 1.184 with the standard deviation of 0 0.587. The strongest of those earthquakes had a magnitude of 2.95. Okay, probably the ultimate question here is, um, is the magnitude of the strongest earthquake usual or unusual? Okay, I might not step you through all of these little steps on the test. We want to know, is it usual or is it unusual? So what we would do first is calculate the difference between the magnitude of the strongest earthquake and the mean. So if we look at x minus x bar, we have 2.95 minus what? 1.184. Okay, if we do that on our calculator, 
we get what is it 1.766 Okay. Then it says, how many standard deviations is that? Okay, so to figure out how many standard deviations, um, we would basically take that number and divide it by 0 0.0587. Or basically, let's just go ahead and find the Z score, because that's what they're leading us up to. Okay, we find the difference and we divide it by the value of a standard deviation for this data set. So it is 1.766 divided by, what's the value of a standard deviation? 0.587. If you divide it, we get what? Okay, 3.008. Okay, a 9, okay. But really, we would just kind of call this 3.0 because we tend to round our z-scores to two decimal places. Okay, I want you to get used to doing that for z-scores, two decimal places. And so when we con uh, consider that usual values are between plus and minus two standard deviations, would we say that this strongest earthquake is unusual? Yes. Okay, yes, it's unusual because it's beyond two standard deviations. All right. What we're talking about in this uh, little section is what we call measures of position. And so when we're comparing data values um, like we just did here, we want to know if that a typical value or atypical. We're kind of looking at its position relative to the others. Okay. Questions about that? Uh, well, it was just saying how many standard deviations is that? It would be about three standard deviations, okay? Um, and let me show you why or how. If our mean is, what is it again, 1.184? If I add one standard deviation, which is 0.587, we get what? Okay, what is it? Okay, 1.771. Okay, if I add a second standard deviation, so add 0.587 again. Okay, 2.358. And let's add it one more time. Add 0.587 again. Okay, 2.3. 945. Okay, now remember, we rounded off. This came up to be um, 3.009. Okay, but we rounded off. But do you see, we could say that the value, uh, what was our value? 2.95, that's what we were kind of aiming for. Yeah, that's exactly what we were aiming for. That is one, two, three standard deviations above the mean. Do you see that? And that's what the z-score tells us. It tells us how many standard deviations a value is above or below the mean. Okay? All right, so they were just kind of walking us through it. But when I found the z-score, I found the answer to be. It is, you know, 3.0 approximately. Okay, very good. It would, I mean, if it was 3.5, I'd, I'd say 3.5. Okay, no, we're going to round our Z values to two decimal places. Yes, always to two decimal places. Okay. Okay, very good. Okay, here's another example of um, using the Z score to determine if something is uh, usual or unusual. It says, in the process of designing aircraft seats, it was found that men have hip breaths with a mean of 36.6 centimeters and a standard deviation of 2.5 inches. That has to be a typo. 
Otherwise, this is going to be a very difficult problem. Okay, let's just say that's what it says. Consider the values of hip breaths of men that are unusual. What are the hip breaths that separate the unusual hip breaths from those that are usual? Okay, we just said um, usual values are where? <coughs> within what? Two standard, or two... Um, yeah, within two standard deviations. So to find those values, we would say x bar plus or minus 2s. Okay? And that looks like x bar in this case was what? 36.6 minus 2 times 2.5. Okay? And then 36.6 plus 2 times 2.5. Okay, if we do minus, we get what? Okay, and if we do plus, we get... Okay, let's make sure that we answer the question. It says, what are the hip breaths that separate the unusual from those that are usual? So this would be it. Okay, 31.6 to 41.6 separates the uh, unusual from usual. If you're between these widths, then that's usual. If you have a hip breadth that's less than 31.6, that's considered unusual. If it's greater than 41.6, that's also considered unusual. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay, we've got a range of values. Men, and what these values are, are hip breaths for men. Okay? And so what we're saying is within this range, we would say is usual, typical. Okay? But if you fall below this or above this, we would say unusual. Okay. Questions about that? Just width. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the width, um, they chose to say breath. Okay. All right. Questions about that? Okay, very good. All right. Here's one other way um, that we use these Z scores to make comparisons. Uh, if we have values that come from different data sets, okay, and we want to compare those data sets, then we might need to look at a measure of position instead of the raw, raw score. Um, you know, I just heard you all talking about different instructors. So different instructors may test, you know, uh, a harder than, than another. And so, you know, your... 72 in one person's class might potentially be better than an 80 in somebody else's. It's not really fair just to look at those, you know, the number. You have to also consider the average of the class and the spread of the class and everything like that. So Z-scores would allow us to compare data values that come from two different sets. Okay, so here's an example. Sandra Bullock, who I love. I like to watch her movies. Um, was the last woman to win an Oscar for Best Actress, and Jeff Bridges was the last man to win for Best Actor. I'm not sure when that was. Um, was it what? I don't know. The book just came out, so I don't know. But anyway, uh, at the time of the awards ceremony, uh, Bullock was 45 years of age, and Bridges was 60 years of age, based on data set 11 in Appendix B, the best actresses have a mean age of 35.9 years and a, and a standard deviation of 11.1 years. The best actors have a mean age of 44.1 years and a standard deviation of 9 years. Relative to their genders, who was younger when winning the Oscar, Bullock or Bridges? Okay, well, if we just looked at the raw numbers, uh, Sandra Bullock was 45 years old. He was 60. So we might say, just looking at the raw numbers, she was. 
but we really need to look at the entire data set. They came from two different data sets, so in order to make a fair comparison, we need to measure their position. Okay? So to do that, I'm going to use the z-score. Okay, z equals x minus x bar divided by s. Okay, x in this case uh, for Sandra Bullock is 45. The mean for actresses is 35.9. And the standard deviation is 11.1. Okay, so 45 minus 35.9 is what? Okay, 9.1 over 11.1, we get, what's the, 0 0.82. Okay, so what this says is her age, is that what everybody got? Okay, her age is, 0.82 standard deviations above the mean for her group. Okay? All right, I, that's what I know. It's 0.82 standard deviations above the mean. That gives me some idea. Right away I can tell you that it's not atypical. Right? Because that's within, well within two standard deviations. Right? Y'all are quiet on me today. Okay. All right, let's look at Mr. Bridges. While y'all think about that. Okay, for him, uh, his age we said was 60. The average for his group, okay, 44.1 and standard deviation, okay, 9. And so when you do that, 1. What? 1.77. So he was farther above the mean in terms of the number of standard deviations than she was in her group. So relatively speaking, and in the raw numbers, but relatively speaking, now we can say, who was younger? Sandra Bullock. Okay, because her number compared to all the values in her data set was closer to the mean, or not as far above the mean as his was. He was getting towards atypical. Okay, he didn't pass it yet, but he was getting there. Questions about that? Well, yes and no. I mean, you could have just said, yeah, he was older, you know, but we didn't really know in comparison to his group. All right. And it's possible that it could have come out differently. That's right. Possible that yeah. Probably that would happen in that case. Okay. Do you see that? I mean if we put fifty two in there, fifty two minus thirty five point nine, okay, then divide that by eleven point one. Mm, okay, she needs to be a little bit older. Uh, but I mean there could be maybe fifty nine, yeah. Okay. But to compare the two different sets, this is the way we do it. Okay, questions about it. What's that? Yeah, I can't either. Oh, what are they? Oh, yeah, I know that movie. Okay. That was a long time ago, though. The, okay. But this book just came out. Like, I don't know. But anyway, okay, that's fine. <laughs> I, guess, I guess he couldn't have done it for last year because, anyway, that's a whole other story. Yeah, look, I understand how to do everything. Mm -hmm. You just I don't know why. Okay. Like, why? Okay. Like, why? Why? Okay. Yeah, when we look at the raw numbers, you're right. She's younger. Okay. 
Okay. Of course, the mean is at the center of our data, right? And so, again, remember that the z-score measures how far we are from the mean in terms of the number of standard deviations. So, since both of these values are positive, even if we didn't know their actual ages, we just had their z-scores, I would know that they were both above the average, the mean, because they're both positive. Okay? So I know that first. And then um, from there, how far above the mean? Well, she's only 0.8 above the mean. He's even farther above his mean. So relatively speaking, he's older in his group than she is in hers. Right. Does that make a little more sense? Okay. All right. Other questions? Okay, very good. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yes. Right, and then looking at the z-scores that come out. And doing it on the calculator in one step, make sure you're including uh, this numerator in parentheses. Okay. All right. Okay. So think on z-scores. Another measure of position is percentiles and... Um, percentiles just let us know what percentage of values are at or below um, the X value that we're looking at. Okay, you hear about percentiles all the time. If you've ever taken a child to the doctor or something like that, they talk about their, uh, the, their 88th percentile for height, their 75th per percentile for weight. That lets that compares them to other children in their category and lets you know, you know, how how they compare. You take tests, standardized tests, they give you a percentile score. It lets you know if you're at the 66th percentile, that means you scored better than 66% of the people. All right? So percentiles lets us know uh, what percent of values are at or below x, okay? All right, gives us the percent of values that are at or below x. I'm glad you have your book. Let me look over your shoulder real quickly. Okay, I'm going to take at out. Okay, are below X. Um, goes back and forth between this, depending on who you ask. So this author says below X. So to find the percentile value of X, I'm going to look at the number below X over the entire number in my sample, N. And, of course, we would multiply that by 100% and round it to the nearest whole number because there are only 99 percentiles. You can't be at the 99.5 percentile, okay? So uh, we say P1, P2, P3, up to P99, okay? So that's how we would um, determine what percentile a particular value was at. Okay, if we wanted to convert a percentile to a data value, then we need to use a locator. Okay, um, and what we're going to do, let's say we're looking for the, uh, 30th percentile. We're going to take the percentile that we're looking for, multiply it by the number of values, okay, and then that's going to be our locator. We're going to count up to that value, and that would be the data value that is a particular percentile, okay, and I'll show you in an example, and I'm look over your shoulder one more time. Yeah. 
Yeah, multiplication. This is fine. So the way they have it written in the book is K is the percentile okay, times N. Okay? Uh, we'll look at it in an example, but while we're here, I want to talk about quartiles, Q1, Q2, and Q3. They're just like percentiles, except they break the data up into quarters. So uh, the value that set the first quartile is going to be going to have 25% of the values below it. Okay, the value at the second quartile has 50% of the values below it, and the value at the third quartile has 75% of the values below it. This is P25, this is P50, and this is P. Uh, 75. Okay. This one in the middle is also called the what? Med what is it? Median. median. Yeah, it's the median. Remember, the median is the one that divides the number of values. Okay, the median divides the number of values. Okay. So, example, and then we'll be done with this hopefully. Use the following duration times of 24 eruptions of the old faithful geyser. Uh, find the percentile corresponding to the given time. Okay, so we have a time of 240 seconds. I want to find out what percentile that is. So it looks like the values are already sorted. Here's 240. And I'm going to count the number of values that are below it. There are eight values, and it sound, I think we said there were 24 eruptions listed here. Okay, so eight divided by 24 is 0.33, or so we're going to say times 100%. So we get 33%. So we'd say 20, 240 equals P. 33. We've got 33% of the values below 240. Okay. All right. What about for 260? How many values do we have below it? Okay. So 20 over 24. Okay, times 100%. Okay, that gives us 83. So we would say 260 is at the 83rd percentile. Okay. 260 is at the 83rd percentile. I know. Oh. It is, and this that's probably a better way to say it. It's better to say 240 is at the 33rd percentile. When I did that, I realized that that could be confusing. Okay. All right. Although if you said it that way, it wouldn't, you know, I don't think anybody would write a news article about it. So, <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, we want to find the indicated percentile or quartile. And so we've got uh, P30. 
So I'm looking for uh, the value in my data set such that we have 30% of the values below it. And so I'm going to look at um, 30 over 100 times 24. Okay. Right, we're using the locator. This is my locator. Okay, so 30 over 100 times 24 gives me what? Okay, 7.2. There's a chart in your textbook on page 116. It says if it's a whole number, then we're going to go halfway between that value in the list and the next value. If it's not a whole number, we're just going to round up. We'll round up to the next whole number. So we came up with 7.2. So we're going to round up to the eighth value. So in this case, I would say P30 equals whatever the eighth value is in my list, in my arranged list. So 1, 2, 3, 237. Okay. Questions about that? How did I get the 7.2? Um, okay, this was our locator. We put 30 here over 100. That's basically 30% of the 24 values. Yes, and that's what they asked us to find was P30. Okay. That's what I was looking for. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. When we put 8 right here, there were 8 values below. So for 230 or 240, we had 8 values below. Okay, then this is a different process. It says go to the 8th value. Okay, so the 8th value is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. It's still 8 values below 240. Okay, and they came out different. Uh, 237 we called P30. This one we called it was at the 33rd percentile. So they are different. No matter what that, after that seven, you always go to the eight, you always go to the next We round up. Because okay. mm -hmm. we want to make sure. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. Other questions? All right. P80. Um, so I would do 80 over 100 uh, times the number of values, 24, 19.2. Okay, that's my locator. Right, we'd say the 20th value. So I'd say P80, 259. Okay, P80 is 259. Okay, we were looking for the 80th percentile, so it's 80 divided by 100. Okay, times the number of values, they said it came out to 19.2. And according to his chart, we round up to the next whole number. And so it's the 20th value. Right. And so in our ordered list, we count it up to the 20th value. Okay? And then C is the third quartile. And so um, that's the same thing as saying what? P75. Very good. And so we do 75 over 100 times 24, which is going to be what? 18. 18. Okay, so P, or we'll say Q3 is what? 255. Okay, the third quartile is 255. 
Okay. And there are lots of things. Now we can say that we've got 25% of the data above 255 and 75% below. Yes, ma'am. That's right. Okay, the third quartile is the same as the 75th percentile. All right, other questions? Okay, good. All right, and then I think um, there was just a little piece there about the five number summary. I'm not worried about box plots. Five number summary is the, oh, it's just a box. So just <laughs> minimum. <laughs> Q1, oh my gosh, let's see, the maximum, <laughs> Q3, and the median. Okay, that's the five number summary. And you use those numbers to draw a box plot, but you know, uh, the only place I've seen a box plot in the last 20 years is in one of these books. So I don't think we need to talk about it. But these numbers are useful in describing a data set. Um, you know, what's the minimum value? What's the maximum value? And when you put it together with the box plot, you can look in the textbook and see what he does with that. But when you put it together with uh, a box plot, it lets us know a little bit about the distribution of our data. Okay? Um, and I'll just leave it at that. Okay? But lo and behold, we have finally made it to the end of chapter two, or chapter three. Oh.